All right, maybe they'll be here later. All right, Second Timothy, if you will. We, we don't have any specials tonight. I'll try my best to get you, to get you in and out. Second Timothy. Now, this is one of those things that uh, it's it's not a real, <laughs> it's not a real comfortable thing uh, to talk about. It's one of those things that we find in the Bible about human nature that we have a tendency to do when we're not getting what we think we need, and so we become our own advocate. In the book of Proverbs, he says, Let another man praise thee. He doesn't say there's anything wrong with getting praise, but he just said it shouldn't be coming from you. One of the signs of the last times, the Bible says, Lovers of self-covetous, and then guess what follows that? Boasters. That's somebody who is constantly bragging on their accomplishments and what they've done and how they see life according to them through their own eyes. Notice, if you will, please, for men shall be lovers themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. While you're standing, come to the book of uh, uh, Psalm 75. Psalm 75. I'll let you be seated here in just a minute. Just kind of feel like you're doing a sword drill. Brother Ed, good to see you and your family made it in from the monsoon. Glad you're here tonight. Psalm 75. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 6. Psalm 75, verse 6. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. One more. Proverbs 27. So what he just said there is, is oftentimes boasting comes from self, a uh, person seeking recognition. It can come from insecurity, inferiority, attention seeking, from comparing, from being covetous of somebody else. If somebody doesn't toot your horn, you wind up tooting it yourself. That's one of the things that are difficult, that's difficult for people to understand. Proverbs chapter 27, verse number 1, boast not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not, Proverbs 27, 1, what, de what a day may bring forth. Brother Sam, you pray and ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Thank you for a chance to be back here again this evening. Thank you for a real good service this morning for, uh, for all the folks that were able to make it. Uh, for a church full of visitors and visiting folks, God, I pray that you, uh, you impress on the heart what they heard this morning and help them be able to think about it and take it into consideration. God, thank you for our preacher for the chance to be able to hear him again this evening. God, I pray that you fill him with the Holy Ghost to help him preach as you have him to and help us to listen to Jesus' name. Thank you. You can be seated. I'm glad they made it in. Had to come all the way from Russia, but they're here. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Now, I wrote this note to myself. The root of boasting is obviously self-love. You talk about what you love the most, yourself. Boasting is talking about one's self and one's accomplishments. Now, I'm not talking about when the Apostle Paul is justifying himself, when he is using himself as an example or an illustration, uh, comparing himself to other individuals who claim to be um, uh, kind of high up, kind of have obtained some things. Paul said, listen, I was all of the things that you're boasting of being. Uh, anybody obtained, I obtained. If anybody was anybody, I was all of those things. And then Paul it says to that, but I counted it all but dung. So Paul's talking about that wasn't boasting about his accomplishments for self-promotion or for lifting himself up. The Apostle Paul was simply drawing a parallel or a correlation to he's around a bunch of Pharisees who were thinking that the epitome or the pinnacle of the temple, the pinnacle of the mountaintop, uh, being the, the poster child for success, is somebody that has obtained all this thing. Above the law, blameless, and the Pharisee of the Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin, and I've been appointed this and appointed that. And Paul said, let me just clarify, I counted it all but done. That doesn't mean anything. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, when he comes down through there, he says, are these the ministers of Christ? He's going to be a little sarcastic. He said, I more. I'm more of a minister of Christ. But then he describes the ministry in a way that nobody describes the ministry. In the ministry, when you describe it in 2 Corinthians 11, if you look at the Apostle Paul's letter in 2 Corinthians 11 that he writes about the ministry, you could define it by one word, pain. I mean, there is constantly, I mean, he is beaten. He's a day and a night in the deep. He's shipwrecked. He's put in jail. He's naked. He's in perils. He's in all kind of difficulty. And then he said, and above all that, the care of all the churches. A constant beating, battering, and banging of the Apostle Paul's life. Paul, so Paul's not bragging, saying, I've done all these things. The only thing Paul does is he says, we boast, we brag, uh, we are pleased with our infirmities. 
Wow, Paul, you're kind of a little whacked out there. You're a masochist, you're a sadist to think that. But Paul said, no, I've learned that when I'm weak, he's strong. And I've learned that the best thing for me is to go through that. That's the most difficult for you things you and I to understand. The most difficult thing in the world is, is why pain comes in your life, why trouble comes in your life, why difficulty comes in your life. That's part of the message tonight. So what oftentimes people do to cover up for that is, is boasting is a way of saying, now God, if I've done all this and I've accomplished all this and I've become all these things, why would you let this happen in my life? In other words, Lord, I don't understand why you would allow trouble and trials and difficulties to come in my life. I haven't done anything worth of having that taken place. Oftentimes, boasting is a way of talking kind of through a side door to God when you're talking to Him and say, Lord, this doesn't make any sense to me. I'm pure as a driven snow. You remember the Pharisee that's over there? And he says, uh, Lord, I want to follow you. And the Lord said, you want to follow me? He said, yeah, I'd do anything in the world to follow you. He said, okay, go sell all you got and come follow me. And the guy kind of hesitates and says, what? He said, well, you know the law, don't you? Yeah, I've kept it from my youth up. Loved my neighbor and myself and done this and that and the other. And so on. the Lord said, okay, good. Go sell all you have. You say, what was his problem? His problem was is that he had something between him and God. And it was who he thought he was that what riches brought to him. When the Lord put him to the test, you know what happened? He said, if you want to follow me, you've got to give up the things that are most valuable to you. You know what boasting is? It means you're more valuable to yourself than maybe you think God sees you. I'm not trying to be harsh with you. I'm just simply saying any preacher that doesn't show you the things that are in the Bible in human nature, which is why the Bible's written, is to reveal the things that you have the potential to be, but you don't have to be. So if I go to the doctor and the doctor tells me when I walk in there, listen, you keep using that knee the way you're using that knee. You are going to blow out a disc. You're going to have a problem with your knee or a meniscus. You're going to have a problem with this. You're going to have to have surgery. You're going to have to have a knee replacement or whatever. Now, if you'll listen to me and do some rehab and change some things about how you're handling that and wear a brace when you're doing whatever the activity is, you may be able to avoid surgery. Now, the difference is, is that I don't have to have the surgery because I stopped doing what could have led to permanent damage. I played ball with a guy and he was pretty well known and he did a pretty good job playing ball. He did a great job playing ball. He was a star athlete and those kind of things. And he had people around him pushing him to the point that he was putting needles and stuff in places so where he was trying to anesthetize the pain just so that he could play. And the doctor told him, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're not aware of the damage you're doing. You are going to be a cripple by the time you're 30. But he wanted to get the recognition. He wanted to get all, all the fame. He wanted to get everything he could get. So instead of taking the doctor's advice, he thought, you know, I can just play through it and then I'll wind up having surgery later on and I'll get it all cleaned up and fixed up and that kind of a thing. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. And now I don't even know where he's at or what he does, but he certainly didn't make it to the pros like he thought he would. Here's the illustration. God puts these things in the Bible not just to put a finger in your face and say these are the things you're guilty of and you're wicked and ungodly. He puts them in there as roadblocks or stop signs or yield signs along the way to say to you and I, listen, first of all, always be conscious you're going to tend by human nature to love yourself above everything else. Second of all, understand that what goes with that self-love is thinking that you deserve more than you currently have covetousness. And the third thing is, is that when you're not getting the recognition that you think you deserve, then what you're going to do is because you love yourself and because you desire or covet that recognition, you're going to start bragging on yourself and all your accomplishments. And before long, you'll see liars show up here, but you're probably going to stretch it into something where the fish was this big, but you say, you know, I got a fish this big. <laughs> And the next thing you know, look at what a great fisherman I am. Are you with me in the book of James? Look at what it says in James in chapter number, uh, make it, let's see, I want James uh, 4. There it is, James chapter number 4. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Humble is the direct opposite of, uh, of boasting. Humble means I could speak, but I'm not going to speak. Humble means I could brag on what I have done or what I have accomplished. Have you ever been around what people, what I call one-uppers? 
You come back from the greatest vacation in the world, right? I mean, for you, it was the greatest vacation in the world. You went to Disney World and you got to ride the roller coaster ten times. You got off. You went around the line. They let you in. You got right in there again. You had the fast pass or whatever it was. And for you, it was the epitome of what a vacation ought to be. You went home. You ate lobster and steak. And you got up the next morning. You were first in line. They let you through whatever that vacation might be. You went to Hawaii. You went to the Philippines. You went wherever it was. And you came back. And so people are saying, hey, man, you're all tanned and all that kind. How was your vacation? Man, it's the greatest vacation in the world, man. I got to ride the roller coaster 10 times right in a row. They gave me a special pass. I got to ride right up front. I mean, got pictures of me coming down like this. Into the water. Man, it's the greatest thing in the world. Here's the one upper. You got to ride it 10 times. I rode it 11 times. <laughs> and I won't tell you who was sitting next to me, but can you say president? <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, I'm sure you had a great time. But you couldn't have had as good a time as me. Right? Boy, I had a great meal the other day. I went down to Burger King, man, and they let me have it my way. Man, it was the greatest hamburger ever. How I can, you can't believe that. Last time I was down at Burger King, they gave me VIP. I was, I was a thousand customer walking in the door, and they gave me free food for a year. I'm sure it was a great hamburger you had, but you ever been to the Capitol Grill? Where is that, in Tallahassee? What, is, what, is, what do you mean, the Capitol Grill? Was that in Washington? No, that's one of those nice places, not Burger King. You say, what is that? It's a way of boasting by putting somebody else down. See, the one-uppers. Now, here's the thing. While they may be jerks, you don't want to be one of those jerks. You want to catch yourself because somebody else is talking about, yeah, man, I got up and bases were loaded and this and that and the other. And, you know, I hit it over the left fielder's head and so on and so forth. Well, you know, back when I was getting tried out for the World Series and stuff like that, you know, coming down to the bottom of the ninth, bases are loaded and full count, three and two on me. I stepped back there and pointed at that fence right there, man, and they throwed that ball across there. I hit that thing. So I didn't hit it over left field. I hit it over center field. It was still going when it passed the final bleacher on the top out there, <laughs> landed out in the parking lot somewhere. And you're thinking, really? Are you kidding me? And even if the story's true, it's why did you decide to tell me now? Because it's an opportunity. Oh, well, I was just talking about it. He brought it up. No, you're bragging on yourself. Now watch, he says right here, humble yourself. That means the Lord puts it in mine and your hands to make a decision as to how we're going to be as a person. An obnoxious person is somebody that's always bragging on everything they've done. They always do it right. They've always done it right. And they're always telling you everything that they did do so that they get the recognition. Now let me show you what the Bible teaches you here. Come all the way down, if you will, please, in verse number 13. Same passage, James chapter number 4. He said, go to now, ye say that. Today or tomorrow we will go into the such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, on the morrow, excuse me, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and that van then vanisheth away. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your what? boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. Can I put it in context for you? When you're saying all you're going to accomplish tomorrow and talking about all the great things you're going to do, you know what the Lord said? Uh, you might want to say if the Lord will there because you don't even know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. Boasting can be I'm going to be something tomorrow when the Lord said you better hesitate, you may not see tomorrow. Uh, the funeral we had here yesterday, it was sudden. He's only 61 years of age. He'd had some problems and difficulties and things. His daughter came out and found him in the, in the, uh, uh, the living room out there, and he was gone, laid out on the couch and gone. Not, not doing that, not smoking, not you know, drinking, doing all kind of stuff. He just laying there while the TV was on, and they all went to bed and got up in the middle of the night, and there he is gone. They didn't make any plans for that to be gone. It was sudden. Terrible. The grief that was here was terrible. It's horrible. You say, why? You didn't make plans. You don't know that I may not be you tonight. You have no way of knowing that. So you have to be careful. It's boasting. It's, it's, it, it is the Bible says it's evil for you to say, this is what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm not saying don't put up some nuts for tomorrow for what might happen, but make sure when you do, you always add, if the Lord wills, but if he chooses to punch my number tonight, I'm gone. 
but to act like the farmer did in the book of Luke when he's laying there looking at all that he has. And you know what he says? He said, man, I'm loaded. <laughs> man, I'm a fat cat. I got it. Man, I tell you what I'm going to do next year. I'm going to solve this problem with that stuff sitting out there in the middle of the road uh, going to waste. And instead of giving it to all these vagabonds and poor people and that kind of stuff, I'm going to fix this problem. I tell you what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to build bigger barns. I'll have plenty. Now, by the time my crops come in next year, I'll have plenty of room for the crop. Making some pretty big assumptions. Number one, even if you are there, you're assuming your crops are going to be as big or bigger than they were the year that you had. Second of all, that you have the resources to be able to put up the bigger barns you're talking about doing. But third and most importantly, here's what the Lord says. Thou fool, don't you know your soul's required of thee tonight? You can make all those great plans of what you're going to do. And the Lord comes in and said, nope, your time's up. The ticket's been punched. So what happens is, is oftentimes come to 1 Peter chapter number 5, please. 1 Peter chapter number 5. Is oftentimes we take for granted that we're going to be here tomorrow. I'm just saying we should be cautious. That's why I mentioned to you this morning, make your decisions in light of the judgment seat of Christ. That way you know that the eternal things are definitely going to happen. They're going to take place sooner or later, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's tonight, or whether it is when the rapture takes place. But if you make your decision there, you won't regret it when you get there. But once you get there, you can't back it up and say, oh, can I have a do-over? Do you understand? But oftentimes we put more effort and more emphasis on what we're going to do tomorrow than we think about what am I going to do in eternity. And so I'm just asking you to pause, to reset, to rethink for a moment. Okay, I got to be careful that I'm not boasting about things I don't know. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You might say, yes, guess maybe so. But what if the Lord changes your plans along the way? Amen. Have you ever said this? Lord, I'm willing to be made willing. You sure about that? Do you have any idea? Do you know yourself well enough to know what it would take to make you willing? Lord, you can do whatever you want to do. Brother Roger sang last week that song, Whatever It Takes. That's a great song. Uh, Lord, whatever it takes for my will to break. But what God wants you to do is to break your own box. Mary comes over there in John chapter number 14 there. When Mary comes along there, that's a left-hand page there. I think it's 14 there, 13, 14. Anyway, when she comes into that uh, the situation there, she's got an alabaster box. And it's full of, of spikenard, very costly ointment, right? She doesn't take the lid off of it. She breaks the whole box and pours it on the Lord. Now here's what she says when she does that. The Lord said about Mary, let this be a memorial unto her because she did what? What she could. There's no record of Mary preaching a sermon, yet that sermon has been preached for Mary a multitude of times. So it's not that God can take a hammer and bust your box. God wants you to be willing to say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. You want to bust my box? Bust my box. But he would rather say, rather you say, Lord, here's my box and it's already broken for you to use. What does he do? He sets the example. He's the precursor for that. He's the alabaster box that's broken. Uh, there's a, a black lady that sings a song about it. It's a little charismatic-y, but it's a, it's a song about that lady who broke her box. I can't think of the name of it right now. But when she sings that song, man, the touch of God's on that thing because she knows that she was wicked and ungodly and she broke the box and the ointment full, poured out and, and that kind of a deal. Jesus Christ comes. You know what he says to his apostles? This is my body which is broken for you. Amen. Nobody took the Lord's life. You say, why? And John, he says, nobody takes my life. I lay it down. What he wants is, is if he was willing to break his own body for you and I, he wants us to humble ourselves and break yourself. Don't force him to try to humble you. The idea is, you know, well, be humble or you'll stumble. Be humble or God will take you down a peg or two. Well, the devil's never been humble. The opposite of humble is pride, boasting. Look at what I'm going to do. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. The Lord said, you will if I will. And down you go into the hell and the devil still doesn't believe he can be changed. Is this making sense to you? Do you understand that human nature, God's given you this stuff, not as a rebuke unless you're guilty of it, but to tell you, you better watch out. You better watch out. You keep on running on that knee and don't do something to take. You're going to have a busted knee. 
You keep doing this, it's going to lead to all the other 23 things that are in the passage. You better watch it. Human nature is, is to brag on yourself and brag on your accomplishments and brag on your kids and brag on your job and brag on your car and brag on your house and brag on your clothes and brag on your strength and brag on, you know, and all that. Sometimes in sports they call it trash talking. You ever notice that? Both teams are talking about the other and we're going to whip you and we're going to take you to the cleaners and we're going to take you to the mat and all that. One of them loses. Just a bunch of talk. My dad used to just say, he played with a couple of guys at a pretty high level and a couple of those guys, what they would try to do all the time is they would try to talk him. The only way they could beat him was to try to talk him to death. Trevino was real good at that. Trevino would get guys to talking so much because he was laughing and joking and cutting up and sarcasm and sticking them and jiving and juking with them all the time like that, that it got them out of what they were supposed to do. But they were constantly just sticking him stuff and saying stuff like that. And I said, well, Dad, why don't you say something about it? He said, son, you have to understand something. He said, all they want to do is talk about what they can do. He said, what they need to do is just put up or shut up. And he said, I'll let my game speak for itself. Now, you may think that's arrogant. He didn't say that to them. I was his caddy. <laughs> I, was the, I was the $5 a loop guy. I carried that big old bag that was as big as me, man, with double straps on it. Him, you okay, bud? I can carry it if you need me to. And, you know, no, no, I'm good. I got it. I'm, I'm all right. We walked in those days. You're riding a cart, man. And many a day I'm out there walking around and I'm saying, and my dad just looked at me one time and I got, I got mad. I was a little kid. One guy just sh wouldn't shut up, just kept talking, man. And I'm thinking, man, good night, dad. I, you know, I'm going to hit him. I'm a little kid, but I'm thinking I could hit him with a two iron, you know. <laughs> I mean, maybe, you know, get his attention if nothing else. And I knew if I hit him, then my dad would finish it, you know, because if the guy came at me, then my dad would, you know, jump in for me. <laughs> And that's when he pulled me over to the side under an oak tree at Brainerd Golf Course in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And he said, son, you need to learn a lesson. It don't matter how much man can talk and how many things they can tell you about how good they are and what many rounds they've won and how great they are. He said, it's in the here and now and they either have the game or they don't. He shot 60-something that day and cleaned that guy's clock by better than 10 strokes. He never said a word. The guy just talked. You'd think he was Arnold Palmer or Jack Nicholas or Tiger Woods by the time you listen to that guy. He just talked. All that old man did was just keep knocking him in and knocking him in and knock it two or three feet here and bump one up there. And next thing you know, you say, What happened? See, boasting sometimes make you think you're something you're not, legend in your own mind. Talk about certain times in life where you had moments of greatness. <laughs> The only guy, the, probably the biggest boaster that I've probably ever seen in my life uh, is a man named Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali. You may know him by one of the two things. He'd float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. He was one of the few guys that I don't know, I kind of had a hard time believing that he was always boasting because he said it and then he did it. You know? <laughs> so I don't know that that's really boasting, but that guy had a mouth on him. And I mean, he could flat talk, him and Howard Cosell, and they would get going back and forth in the announcer. But buddy, when that bell rang, he'd get out there and get to bobbing and weaving and popping and doing all this other kind of stuff. And, you know, I am a flea. He's down in three, you know, and that kind of a thing. <laughs> You know, and then sure enough, number three would come up, you know, he'd be, you know, <laughs> and then plow his taters, man, <laughs> down in three. I don't know that that's boasting because you could back it up. But spiritually speaking, that shouldn't be us. Spiritually speaking, we shouldn't be bragging on our former accomplishments. What we should be saying is, but by the grace of God, that's right. I was able to accomplish whatever was accomplished. 1 Peter chapter number 5, come all the way down if you will please. You've got to notice the context here. Verse number 5, Likewise, younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all you'll be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Isn't that what we're looking for? Look at verse number 6. Humble yourselves therefore. Why? Don't you want the grace? Isn't that what he said? God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Well, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you need God to give you or grant you grace with certain things. Come to Luke chapter number 18. I think this is the passage I told you about earlier. Luke chapter number 18. You need grace to get through something. Maybe the Lord's like, well, you're so big, you go ahead and handle it yourself. <laughs> you ever had that happen to you? Well, you're so strong, bud, you go ahead and pick it up. I got it, I got it, I got it, I can handle it. I can handle it. 
right? I remember now what I was going to say. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. That's what he was known for. And he did. He floated like a butterfly, but man, when he popped you, he dotted your head. In my day, when you got, when you got dotted, that meant you had lumps all over your head from somebody hitting you so many times. It was like sticking your head in a hornet's nest. Now, I know some of you didn't grow up around that kind of stuff, but, but I, that was what they called being dotted. He got dotted, you know. What well, that means? He's got goose eggs all over his head. Looks like a lawnmower ran over a golf ball man, out there. <laughs> He's like, man, how'd you get so many of that thing? It got hit me so many times, I didn't know which way was coming and going before I could get in. You ever realize that sometimes the Lord doesn't give you the grace to get through what you get through because you've been too big for your britches many times before? You ever realize you start praying for grace and the Lord's like, well, you're such a big shot and you made it here on your own. You handle it. You think you're like me, do you? Okay, good. I'll let you have it. Say, God doesn't care about it. No, it's teaching you a good lesson. It's teaching you a good lesson. You better learn to be humble. You say, why? And that way, when you need God, God will give you grace. You know what he says? He resists the proud. I don't want God resisting me when I'm in trouble. I got enough problems as it is. Come on, give me a little witness. It'll go down a little quicker. We didn't have no singing tonight. You'll be home by six. 30-ish. <laughs> Luke chapter number 18, if you will, come down to verse number 9. He spake a parable unto a certain which trusted themselves, and they were righteous, and despised others. So we look at who he's talking to now. Who's talking? Jesus. Who's he talking to? Uh, people that thought they were righteous. And he said, two men went up. I like the way the Lord does this. He's the best side door, back door man you've ever seen in your life. Two men went up into a temple to prayer. The one the Pharisee, the other publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed within himself. God, I prayed, I prayed within himself thus. God, I thank thee I'm not such as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this uh, publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, smote upon a breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. Pretty good lesson. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You start talking about what you're going to do, where you're going to go, and how it's going to work out for you because you're the mover and the shaker and you've got certain contacts and certain people and certain things and you've got your whole life laid out and your political aspirations laid out and you've got all your money financial situations laid out and all that kind of stuff and then all of a sudden you did. Now what you're going to do with all it took you your life to get it ready for? I can tell you what you're going to do. Jody's going to move in. That's one of them names that can go either way. You can have a girl named Jody or a man named Jody. Yep. But Jody's going to move in and take over whatever you spent all your time doing about because you were all trying to do, make yourself secure, make yourself self-sufficient, make yourself be the individual, take care of yourself. And so next thing you know, the Lord just says, okay, did you bring this one into the equation? I've seen athletes, some people that I know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and then wind up with a permanent injury and never be able to do anything. Had all their eggs in one basket. I remember a, a black basketball player one time, and I can't think of his name. I was trying to remember it, and I didn't have enough time to look it back up, but it's an illustration that I have. And one of the things that did, he was a real good athlete right out of high school, and he had a talk with his dad before they were going to call him up there. He was only 18 years old, but he was a phenomenal athlete. Maybe you all don't know who it is when I finish the story, but he's a phenomenal athlete. And they came to him and said, we want to take you straight to the pros. We're not even going to put you through college. We'll take you straight to the pros and, and that kind of a thing like that. And his daddy said, said, son, one day your basketball career is going to be over. And if it happens to end in the first year in the NBA, you got nothing to fall back on. So what I think you ought to do is go and play ball in college. You still get the experience and you'll be worth more when you come out anyway. He said, yeah, but daddy, just think about the millions I can make. And his daddy said, and yeah, and just think about this. If you get hurt in your first year, you can say goodbye to that. But if you got an education, you might be able to use it somewhere else. Now, I know what modern language said. Well, if I got the ability sports-wise and I can make a million dollars or $20 million in a year, I'll take that. You ever notice those guys, a lot of those guys, they make $20, $30, $40 $40 million in a year for their sports contract, and then after they're no longer in the league, they don't have anything? What do they spend all that on? How come they don't still have it? We've had some ball players that are here. They had enough sense to go to school. And when their careers were over in the NFL, they're out making a living because they made some smart choices along the way. 
That's the right kind of a thing to do. Not, I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket. Okay, diversify a little bit. Have a little bit of something to fall back on. Use your head for something besides a hat rack. Take your Bible, if you will, please, and come over to... Well, you don't have to go there. Go to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. The passage says this, because boasting is always a part. Come to 2 Corinthians 11. I'll quote the verse for you. He said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of what? Works, Works lest any man should what? You would think that a man would learn not to boast of his own salvation. You know, that's one of the greatest verses on eternal security ever written. You know how, you, how I know that? God told you, I gave you that gift by grace, and you got that gift from me, and I'm not going to take it back from you. And don't ever think that it's depending upon what you do or did. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift of God. Why? One of the greatest things He gave you is not of worse, lest any man should boast. You say, why? He knows human nature. You ever listen to these preachers stand up and preach to you about how proud you ought to be, about how good you are and what a great person you are and how they hold themselves in such high esteem because they don't do whatever the list of things not to do is and listen to all that? What's all the boasting about? What's all the bragging about? All the things you don't do. What does that do? Died and left you God or something? What does that mean? That's what the Pharisees did. They're always bragging and boasting. That's what that Pharisee was doing. The Lord's talking to them. They're talking about, they think they're righteous. The Lord said, oh yeah, did you hear the story about a couple guys that went down there? They both went to the temple. They worshiping and all. And one of the guys comes in there and he you know, says, I pray and I fast twice a week, you know, and I give him my tithes and so on and so forth. And I'm not guilty of fornication or adultery. It lets you know where their minds are. They're thinking about those things. That's why God put that in the passage there when He's talking to them. And I'm sure a couple of them guys are standing around going, yeah, that's, I'm, I, I do that. I, them guys are righteous. I, that's the story's about righteous men, right? And Yeah, sure, I get that. I understand that. And then uh, there's a publican over there. I thank God I'm not like that publican. Won't even raise his head up, just beats himself on the chest and said, Lord, be merciful to sinner. And the Lord said, you know something, boys? There's an interesting thing about that story. Yeah, Lord, say on. What is that message? He said, you know, the second of those two guys will go in justified before the other one. What do you mean to go in there? He ain't righteous. The Lord said, yeah, he knows his position and he's not bragging on it. He knows he got to get there with somebody to help him. This other guy thinks he's getting in on his own merit. Boy, you talk about slap your mouth shut. But you know what I hear in a lot of Christian circles? I hate to say this, it's about our people, but everybody else talks about it. It's time we talk about ourselves. You know, here all, all the time, boy, I, I'll never sin. I'll never mess up. Here's a good one. I'll never quit. Whoo, you better watch out. Jeremiah, pretty good preacher, wasn't he? Jeremiah, well, I mean, wrote a big long book in the Bible right there. Jeremiah was a pretty good preacher. You know what he said? I quit. Elijah, pretty good prophet, would you agree? Yes. You know, he said, enough, Lord, kill me. Yep. Moses, pretty good prophet, pretty good leader, I'd say. You know, he said, Lord, blot my name out of the book. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm through. I'm finished. I've had enough of these cotton-picking people. Kill me. Take me out of the way. It's a good thing him and the Lord didn't get on the same page the same day. Moses would have been in a mess. But here's the thing you have to understand. You make a statement like that, you're a fool. That's the epitome of being an idiot. You say, why? You're, you're saying you, you've got that ability in and of yourself to be able to retain that relationship with the Lord. No, you better not be boasting yourself of tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow might bring. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, come all the way down to verse number 30. Here's Paul. He's going to boast a little bit. He's going to brag a little bit. Look what he says, verse number 30. If I must needs glory, I mean, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you some things about my life. I'm in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 30. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine, what? Who would ever think Paul was bragging when he's talking about a day and a night in the deep and all the stuff he's went through and painfulness and watchings often and hunger and cold and nakedness and perils and so on and so forth and a shipwreck and all that. Of the Jews five times I received I 40 stripes and saved one and this and that and the other. Who would think Paul would be bragging on that? He said, if I'm going to boast, if I'm going to glory in anything, I'll tell you what I'm going to glory in, things concerning mine infirmities. Boy, that'll keep you humble. Jump over to chapter number 12, same passage right there, and notice what the Apostle Paul says. In verse number 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. 
Why? Because Jesus is lifted up in infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecution and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I read that passage every day for a week to myself to hold myself up to God's measuring stick of what spirituality is. Did I spend my time glorying in the difficulties, the problems, the troubles, the trials, the tribulations, the pressure, the pain, and all that kind of stuff? Was I focused to be able to say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm glorying in that. I sure appreciate that because it manifests you, it exalts you. Lord, thank you for the trouble. As Sister Carol this morning, thank you for the, for the virus and the social unrest. And thank you for not being able to be here because it made me grateful for what I, that kind of thing. I read that thing every day for a week. You know what I felt like? A stinking spiritual pipsqueak. I'm thinking of all the things you brag and boast on, man, and all the things you think you've ever accomplished and all the things you think you've ever done. How could you hold a candle to that? And yet that's what Paul said. Paul said, you know, you want to, it's human nature to boast. Well, then brag on what you've done for Jesus. That's what he's saying. He's not bragging on how tough he was because he took the beatings. You've got the wrong concept. You know what he said? I know when I'm weak. That takes the boasting out. He's strong. He said, all I'm doing is bragging on... And you know what the Jesus thought of me? He thought so little of me, all he made me was just a rag. And he just put me in his back pocket and whenever he needed some dirty work done, he called me to do it. And that's because I'm not in high esteem with everybody else. Of course, we all hold the Apostle Paul in high esteem more so than you could possibly imagine. Come to Jeremiah chapter number 9. Jeremiah chapter number 9. If you're taking notes, and some of you are, and some of you that are watching, you're taking notes. That other passage is in Luke chapter 12. That's the rich farmer that's there. Now, uh, who would have seen a person making future plans and talking about what he was going to do in the future boastful? God would. You just read that passage right there in the book of James that said to you, uh, before you make plans to even go into the city, you better say, if God wills. But who would say in the modern society now, if you were to say, this is what I'm doing tomorrow, that that's boasting? God would say that. He said, boast not thyself of tomorrow. Well, I'm just making plans. You better say, Lord willing. You say, that's just what people say. No, no, that's showing you got, you're using your noggin because you could have a wreck on the way home. It's happened. You could have a heart attack on the way home. It's happened. You could lose your mind. You could have an argument tonight with your wife and life as you know it ceases to exist. And all the plans you had all just went out the window. You can't say that. We don't know that. God looks at things a different way than we look at things. What's the sign of the last days, preacher? All these people talking about all the changes they're going to bring about and all the other things that are going to happen and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. You had a lot of plans two months ago, didn't you, for the summertime? And you were planning on doing all these things. Is that right? Sure. You never thought, well, but what happens if a virus comes in? Nobody ever considered it. Nobody ever even thought of it. I never heard one preacher say the thing's going to be a virus. They prepared you for nuclear Armageddon and everything else, for the cash to crash and you need to have gold and silver and, you know, buy low and sell high and all that other kind of stuff. Nobody ever said, you know, what's going to shut this country down without... They heard talk about martial law. I heard all the stuff. For years I've heard all the stuff. It's going to be martial law. It's going to be tsunamis. It's going to be atomic bombs. It's going to be earthquakes. We're going to get invaded by Russia. We're going to get invaded by China. You got invaded by an invisible bug. That's a God thing. God's like, you think I need a bomb to wipe you people out? If that's what I want to do, I'll send a germ. And you don't even have to believe it's real. I just have you running around acting like it is. Because skin for skin, all that a man, I know how to get you. I know, I know how to bring things to a screeching halt. Martial law, they're going to bring the tro troops out. Oh, they're going to bring this and that. Now the Lord's like, nah, I'm just going to make people feel bad. Because if you're sick, you can't fight. I just shut down your food supply and your water supply and make you think everything you touch got cooties on it. Keep you locked up in your house. I told you the other day about the lady. She said, I learned to knit while I was at the house. And, and the guy picked up and said, what have you been knitting? And she held up a hangman's noose for her husband. <laughs> Another lady said this. She said, I've been at home with myself now for three weeks. 
and I have great compassion and pity on those people I have been around. Please forgive me. <laughs> That's profound. <laughs> It's funny. It's okay. It wasn't you. I'm not talking about you. You were all just, y'all are like, yeah, I can see why people want to stay around me. That's why a lot of you are ready to send your kids back to school. All that stuff you said about school teachers, you're reaping what you said. You're kind of like, I'm sorry I said anything about them at all. I just, they, they are the greatest. They walk on water right now. But isn't it interesting as little as a couple months ago? How all these things were going to happen and then all of a sudden... Just a little old bug, a little old virus, a little old economy shaker. Not just the United States. He shook the world with a microscopic germ. That's, that's awe-striking. That's God that could literally bring a cataclysmic event, 2 Peter chapter number 3, and turn the elements melt with the firmament heat. He said Y'all are worried about how I'm going to go about all this kind of stuff. You're going to get sick. And it's going to spread worldwide. And I'm going to shut it down. And I hear all these people about, well, the economy, and we're going to do this, and the election, we're going to do that. You better say, if God blesses it, if He don't, you ain't going to do nothing. You can talk all you want. I still remember that old man, son. It don't matter how much they talk. Let's just see if they can have the game to match that mouth. Okay, well, we're going to watch and see. Are you with me in Jeremiah chapter number 9? I'm not being smart. I'm just trying to say we're all kind of guilty about that. That's that trash talking that comes along. You know what I know? I know the shadows are always longest when the sun is lowest. In other words, the shadow becomes much, much longer because the sun's down. You know what? When the Lord's not shining in your life the way He ought to be, it's more about you, more about me. John, uh, Jeremiah chapter number 9, look if you will please, down in verse number 23, 923. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wide man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. You know what he just said to you? He just said to you the most important thing that you can do is you don't brag on whatever gift God gave you. Just boast on the fact you know me. What have you done right in your life? Trusted Jesus Christ. Well, what about the house you have? What about the car you have? What about the plans you have? What about the college you went to? What about this and I, I, I know him. I don't even know if all those things were right decisions or not. You don't, you don't know if they were the right decisions. You don't know what having the things you have may not have cost you more than you thought you were paying. You think you got it in balance and you don't realize how many years you might have wasted in order to get there. The boasters become very self-sufficient. They take, a, a, to take one single step. Now, I'm not a medical doctor. We have some that are here and people that are nurses and all. But they tell me this. To take one step, I had to have 200 muscles. Go look it up. Google it, Siri it, Bixby it. Some of you are like, hey, Google. Ten for Google. I need to find out how many muscles are used to take one step. <coughs> yeah, the preacher wants to know. I think he's just throwing out a bunch of baloney. <laughs> Ten for. <coughs> this is Google. <coughs> Go ahead, Google. Yes, he thinks I'm just sleeping, but I, he doesn't know I'm listening to my favorite tunes right now on iTunes while he's running that yak again. <coughs> Go ahead, Google. Yes, he is correct. It takes 200 muscles to take one step. Oh. Then there must be something greater at work than me. You know when you appreciate the fact that it's God that allows you to walk when you can't walk. You know when you appreciate when you can stand under your own power when you can no longer stand. You know what it's like to sit down in a chair and think, 
I'm going to get back up and all of a sudden something ain't working. And somebody has to come help you out of the chair. When you can't get out of the chair under your own power anymore. Then all of what you were going to do begins to change. And you begin to say, Lord willing, cancer don't get me and MS doesn't get me. Some debilitating disease doesn't get me. Really, Lord? 200 muscles to take a step? Yeah. I have a system in you that's called a parasympathetic nervous system. Fancy words for saying some things are working without you thinking about it. Miss Jennifer would know about that. She's a nurse. The Chases would know about that. They're nurses. You can check with them after. Don't, don't check Google. But check with them. That means I blink because my eyes can sense that they're either dry or there's something coming at me even microscopically that I can't see, but the Lord fixed it where I know to blink. I like what Myrna did this morning that when she said, when I'm talking to you, I'm going to close my eyes because she didn't want to see. I thought I could try that, but I think I might stumble and fall down the stairs. But that means that right now while we're talking, have you even thought once about breathing? Do you think about breathing at nighttime while you're sleeping? Or swallowing? You swallow on average a quart of mucus and or spit, saliva, an average of a quart a day that your body just makes. Who did that? How is it your eyes know when you open them, you don't turn them on, they're on. You close them, they're out. And they're on. How does that happen? How about hearing? Do you think, I need to hear? I mean, unless you have a hearing aid. You... <laughs> it's a parasympathetic nervous system. Do you ever pause to think for a minute when it comes to picking up something? You never even think about it. You just naturally you reach for it, your hand closes, you pick it up, and you, don't, you never even give it a thought parasympathetic nervous system. In other words, you don't have to think to accomplish things that literally keep your heart beating, keep your lungs operating, keep your liver functioning, and you never have to think about it because God fixed it. So how dare you and I think that our life is in our own hands? Because right. I hate to tell you this, none of us would ever be able to sleep if you had to think about breathing. That's right. Maybe I'm going to Sleep for three minutes now. Make sure you wake me up and remind me to breathe. You heard about the lady that went in to get her hair cut. And Leanna's heard it. And she walked in there and the, had on her little set of earbuds and stuff. And the lady said, you might want to remove that. She said, no, I really need them. It's okay. Just work around it. And so she's in there and she kind of falls uh, under the spell there. The hairdresser's working on her, getting her taken care of and that kind of a deal. And finally she gets to where she can't get around where her ears are and all that kind of stuff. And she pulled out her earplugs and before long the lady collapsed and fell out on the floor. And she thought, well, I wonder what in the world is going on here. Something ain't right. This, this don't make no sense to me. And she picked up the earphone, listened to it. It said, breathe in, <laughs> breathe out. funny there's things God does for you and he fixed it saved or lost where he's preserving your life and you don't have anything to do with it do you think how many times your heart beats a minute blood coursing through your vein all the capillaries and veins blood vessels running through your system how do you take air that's out here like this and turn it into oxygen which your body recognizes and how does that oxygen get into your bloodstream and oxygenate your blood to make you alkaline and not acidic so that acid doesn't eat you alive from inside? How's that happen? God did that. Amen. Amen. God's like this air right here. You can't see it. You can't live without it. You can live without food for a while. You can live without water for a while. You can't live without air, but about maybe three, four minutes. I mean, even if you're training, but beyond that, you've got to have air. That's like this, God. Where's God? Everywhere air is. Amen. David said, though I make my bed in hell, you're there. Thou art there, he says. Amen. What are you trying to tell me, preacher? 
And be careful about bragging on your accomplishments. Remember, God just said in the passage I read to in Jeremiah 9, how about this for bragging? Just let them know you know me. And beyond that, might be good to be tight-lipped. Just one more or two more statements here, and then we're going to go ahead and go. Um, to take a single step requires better than 200 muscles. Boasting by putting other people down, consumed with the failure of other people, or putting them down is really simple way of showing yourself. How about this? And I got this from another guy. How about this? When you get depressed, write down 10 things you're thankful for. Oftentimes, depression comes from thinking you didn't get what you thought you deserved. Because boasters' plans are always about themselves. And when you're not able to accomplish what you think you should and get what you ought to get, you often get depressed because you weren't able to fulfill that. Be careful about boasting. Let's stand together. We'll be dismissed. Thanks for coming.